Welcome to It's Your Date with Destiny with Apostle Vivian and Pastor Gemma Duncan of Divine Destiny, Destiny Worship Center in Diego Martin. For the next 30 minutes, join us as we take you on a journey of maximizing your potential and realizing your goals through Jesus Christ. Why is it when you need a miracle, it doesn't happen, but when you least expect it, it happens? You are married. You have challenges in your relationship, but your spouse is unwilling to accede to any counseling. Is divorce an option? I'm no How does a parent handle a promiscuous child? A what are considered the do's and don'ts of a born-again couple who is not yet married? There are always more questions than answers. That so here is Apostle Gemma. Very good morning to you. Welcome to Ask Pastor Gemma. I appreciate the fact that you are joining me this morning. Uh, this morning, very, very, very unusual but absolutely important question. Why didn't David kill Saul when the opportunity arose? If you're not a person with a Bible background, you probably don't know who David or Saul. But at least David is King David who wrote the Psalms or most of the Psalms. So uh, most people, that's what you know David for, right? And uh, I'm going to give you a little background to bring understanding to you. But the bottom line is, the underlying question is why he didn't take revenge, right? Saul tried to kill him. He had many opportunities to defend himself. It's not just kill Saul, but defend himself. And he refused. Why? And uh, how does this apply to us today? You know, and that's what we want to talk about because uh, many times we are abused and ill-treated and whatever, and uh, we may feel justified in taking revenge. And God says, no, that is not how I want you to treat with things. Let me be the one to take revenge. So, very interesting, so stay with me. If you're a first-time viewer, my name is Gemma Duncan. I'm married to Apostle Vivian Duncan, and together we pastor the Divine Destiny Worship Center. Our headquarters is in Digo Martin on the Digo Martin Main Road opposite Sodonex Drive. We have branches in Sangre Grande, Shogonas, Faizabad, Rio Claro, one in Tobago, and a branch in Antigua. Very important question. This is an often asked question. In case you're not too familiar, David was a young shepherd. His father, who is Jesse, a nobleman in those days, abandoned him in the bushes to look after sheep while his brothers served the king in the army. Now, obviously, um, being a soldier working for the king was uh, uh, supposed to be, uh, well, a fancy job, you know, and uh, shepherding was something that um, most noblemen didn't send their sons to do. So there's a question mark over um, Jesse's uh, idea, why would he send his son? And David was actually his youngest son, so it didn't make much sense there. But I don't want to stay there. Maybe for another time we could talk about that. Amazingly, David was faithful to the task, and he proved to be trustworthy and responsible. Here is a young boy. He was a teenager. He's the youngest of his father's sons. Um, his father was wealthy, he had many servants, and obviously he had people who could look after the sheep. And for some reason he sent his youngest son David, which made no sense to us. Uh, he didn't even send servants with him, because based on what we read, David seemed to have been alone most of the time. Be that as it may, this young boy had the kind of quality in him, I guess, that God was looking for, because his father wasn't looking at him. Uh, he could have rebelled, he could have felt abandoned, he could have felt rejected, and uh, could have wondered, well, why would he send me here? There were servants, he didn't even send a servant with me, or, you know, and that kind of a thing. Uh, David had experiences where the Bible says he actually had to uh, kill a bear and a lion to defend his father's sheep. So you're talking about territory where one day you could hear that your son is dead, where you had lions and bears. Why would you send a teenager there, right? And he would have been justified to have the wrong attitude there. Uh, but unknown to David, 
a number of things were happening. Sometimes when we find ourselves in certain situations, God allowed us to be there and he's looking at our attitude and how we develop character in those places. And I have found in my personal experience that the things I used to gripe about, God placed me there to learn those lessons. And I didn't always have the right attitude. You know, in hindsight, you know, you learn all these things. They say <laughs> that youth is wasted on the young. Is when you get older, then you value a lot of these things. And the God placed me in certain areas to learn, acquire certain skills. The same thing with David. David didn't realize that God was teaching him a number of things. All right? Um, but so things are happening unknown to David. You know, his father for some reason put him there. Uh, and God is working something. Unknown to David, God rejected Saul as king. There was a king. David was not aware that God rejected Saul. Remember, he is in the sheepfold. He is not privy to the news and what's happening. And the rejection was very private between the prophet and Saul initially. Now, by that time, Saul became oppressed by an evil spirit. And God's plan for David begins to move forward. And we're picking it up in 1 Samuel. You have your Bible. You can check it out. 1 Samuel chapter 16. So God rejects Saul. And he says to the prophet Samuel, I have chosen a new king, a king in waiting. Go and anoint him for me. Verse 6 says, And it came to pass, when they were come, so uh, Jesse invited his sons, he called them, and uh, Samuel was supposed to be anointing the future king. It came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on Eliab, as the eldest son, and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither had the Lord chosen him. The Bible says, And then Jesse made Shammah to pass by, and he says, Neither had the Lord chosen him. Verse 10 says, Again Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel, and Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord had not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Ah, hear all thy children. And he said, They remain it yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. Now we're looking at David's background. He's a young man, very familiar. Obviously, now you realize that his father rejected him. Something it was wrong with that formula. You have eight sons. You didn't even call the eighth one from the sheepfold. Call him and keep him in the back. You know it's not him. But in the event, I, I would want to impress the prophet. You know, I would bring all my sons. He didn't even call him from the sheepfold. And there was a, a feast, a ceremony. He didn't even call him. And when God rejected every one of them, then the prophet said, I know God sent me to your house. Something wrong. You don't have any other children. He said, oh yeah, I have a little one and he keeps sheep. And David comes in verse 12 of 1 Samuel 16. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance, goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Wow. Trade from the sheepfold. He didn't look... You know, ruddy just means we're outside there, so you're healthy looking. The skin would be a different kind of skin tone. He was handsome, a good looking young boy. And uh, it says, uh, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And God begins to work in David's life. Very interesting and intriguing. And guess what? David was also a musician because most of the Psalms, as you know, are songs. And when Saul became troubled with the uh, evil spirit, his workers said, well, uh, you know, 
boss here probably will need somebody to come to play some music to cool you down because you know music does that. If you are a troubled soul, all of us know that. In my worst of times, I have certain favorite songs. I go and I shut myself by my desk there and turn on the songs and I let the songs, I let them go over and over and just minister to me. And uh, so so I said, do you know anybody? And guess what? Here is, I mean, it gets interesting. Verse 15 of 1 Samuel 16 says, And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubled thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, and he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. Evil spirit from God. Interesting. Evil spirit from God. Verse 17, And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. And the servant already knew who he had in mind. And verse 18 says, Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning and plain and a mighty valiant man, a man of war and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Then Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. Wow. We're talking about why didn't David kill Saul when the opportunity arose. Here is David, rejected, sent to hide in the sheepfold, didn't think he had any promise of making any kind of prominent mark or anybody will know him or see him. And he was there. All by himself, David exhibited a certain kind of quality that Saul's employee passing by the sheepfold would observe him. It would seem to me that from time to time that guy would stop and listen to David playing and David didn't realize that. He looked at him and he admired him. And I want you to know that just on our side, that there are many people looking at you. And especially when we profess certain things. And people look at you. And if David did not represent well, he would never have had the opportunity to go to the palace to serve Saul. What was God doing by moving David into the palace? Carrying David to the place where he will ultimately be. <laughs> David was sent by God. He, God orchestrated his path to learn palace protocols. David couldn't learn palace protocols in the sheepfold. He was anointed to be king. How will I learn to be the king? How do I know how to behave? How do I understand protocol? How do I know to eat, to dress? <laughs> you know what I mean? How do I know how to eat at the table? You know, come on, I don't know anything. And God says, you know what? I can send an evil spirit on soul. I rejected him already. And that will be... Uh, your, your, your ticket to the palace because you have to be trained. If you go to the palace to work there, they will train you in all the protocols. And that is where God trained David to be come king. And this is an aside, but I'm saying to you, listen, when God has his finger on you, when God wants you to do something, when God pronounces on you that you're going to become whatever he says you will become, he will orchestrate your path. You may not have the money, you may not have the means, whatever you may lack, he will orchestrate the path. What can we learn from David initially? Good attitude. He didn't complain, uh, he bloomed where he was planted, he did his best. Uh, he, if, I'll tell you the truth, if I were in David's position and a, a lion came, I was going to hide. My father already abandoned me in the bush and not facing a lion for him to kill me to protect your sheep. That's your problem. Sheep could be replaced. Why am I trying to kill myself? Bear? Why am I, you know, you know, dealing with a bear? But David says, no, my father gave me these sheep to protect and I'll protect them with my life. God was watching. And many times, God is looking at our attitude. What do you do? How do you behave? How do you function when you find yourself in a situation that is unfair to you? You should not have been in that position. You should not have been treated in that manner. But God allowed you to be there. What do you do? Because many times, unknown to us, I didn't understand these things before, that God is placing you there and he's trying to build character in you. He's looking to see how well you function in that unseen, unknown place before he transitions you to where he really wants you to go. And many times, we ourselves disqualify ourselves by our attitudes. So, uh, the narrative continues. So David finds himself there. And uh, he doesn't stay there. He doesn't live in the palace all the time. It seems as though uh, from time to time they would come, get him, he would play, go back to the sheepfold. 
one day again we still in um chapter 16 of first samuel david is sent for his messenger comes your daddy wants you to come home when he goes home daddy say you know what i want you to take some food to the battlefield uh and uh, Check your brothers, make sure they were all right and find what's happening with the battle. And David now goes, I mean, he's probably excited. He's a young boy. Uh, uh, his brothers and they are postured as all these warriors and everybody wants to fight for the king and all of that. And David himself is a little warrior in his own right, you know. And uh, he reaches the battlefield and he sees Goliath. And Goliath is there, larger than life, literally taunting the soldiers, taunting the army of God, insulting God and his brothers and all the army, uh, all the soldiers are running, including King Saul. And David says, what will the king give to kill him? Now, come on, what is wrong with this young boy? <laughs> you know, and he was pushed around and so on. He kept asking. His brothers were upset with him call him naughty and insult him. He said, what, you know, what did you do with the few sheep that, you know, of your father, trying to belittle him? And David said, what, what, did I do something wrong? Is there another cause? Look at this guy carrying on. Nobody want to fight him. Finally, he persisted, went to Saul, and Saul says, okay, he thought David was going to kill himself anyhow, and says, you know what, look at you, you, you're unarmed, why don't you use my armor? He puts on Saul's armor. Now, the Bible had said that Saul was hidden shoulder above the average man. So David, imagine you put on the armor, his headpiece or whatever, helmet, the eyes must be quite down by David's um, nostrils. You can't see. It's too heavy. And he said, I can't use this. I will use what I have. He said, what do you have? He said, look, I'm accustomed. That is what I deal with the animals, the wild animals that come to the sheepfold. A sling and stones. And so I'll say, well, go ahead. Because as far as the all were concerned, go and get killed. But at least it looked good that somebody wanted to challenge Goliath. All of us who have any kind of Bible background will know that he killed Goliath. Simply because he went in the name of the Lord. He says, you come to me in sticks and stays, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. It was a miracle. It was God orchestrating David's life. Guess what? The woman started to sing songs about David. And they started to sing, Saul killed his thousand. And David killed 10,000. And then all hell broke loose with David and Saul. I'm not sure that I'll be able to finish this today, but we will talk about it afterwards. Because remember the question is, why didn't David kill Saul when the opportunity arose? Saul forgot that David was a blessing to him. He forgot that David came to sue them. He just wanted to uh, uh, protect his territory. And he already knew that his inheritance was gone. He knew that when Samuel uh, told him God rejected him, it was God didn't just reject Saul, he rejected the line. So he knew that God had anointed another person. He wasn't sure exactly who the person was, but when David killed Goliath and the people started to praise him, Saul got an inkling that perhaps David would be the, the person uh, that would take over from him. From that time, he started to go after him. Opinions vary. I am not a Bible scholar, but they say for 10 years, Saul pursued David from that time. And he made 22 attempts at his life. 10 long years. You know how hard it is to run for 10 years from a, so, a, a, a king with an army? He had thousands of men. And David had to run and elude Saul. Saul tried all kinds of things. You know, I mean, the first attempt was in the palace itself. While David was in the room, uh, you know, playing the harp, he threw the javelin at him, and David ducked. And for 10 long years, 22 attempts at David's life. David was given two wonderful opportunities to kill Saul. He could have killed him, and Saul wouldn't even know what happened. All he knew is was he... Wherever he went, well, he wake up in a different dimension. And David wouldn't touch him. His men were saying, boss, God, give him into your hands. This is the opportunity. You know, this is self-defense. And David said, no, I can't touch him. Why didn't David kill Saul when the opportunity arose? You see, David learned something, and I'm going to leave that with you. 
especially when it comes to succession that God says you will become something. You don't have to remove the opposition. And that's prevalent in workplaces. People do all kinds of things, character assassination. Some people even try obia and necromancy to move somebody from a post. Listen, if God says you're going to be that, you're going to be that. You don't have to let, let God deal with it. And that was David's philosophy. So I'm going to end here and say, listen, whatever God says is for you, is for you. Nobody except you could have bought the plan of God for your life. Despite what people do. Look at David. God himself orchestrating. And I've learned my lessons from David. When God said, this is what is in your future, I wait on God. How long will it take? It's God alone to determine the length of time. But if he spoke concerning you, then I'll tell you the truth. It will come to pass as long as you cooperate with God. Pleasant good morning to you. Have you ever said to yourself, I really wish I can understand the Bible better? I read the Bible, but I simply do not understand it. I wish I knew enough to share my faith. Sometimes I sit in the pew and I don't quite understand because the pastor uses so many scriptures. If you said any of these things, today I have the answer and the solution to your problem. My name is Gemma Duncan. My husband and I are the pastors of Divine Destiny Worship Center with our headquarters in Digo Martin. And we have a program called the School of the Bible that I would like to introduce to you today. School of the Bible is a one-year program for simple, regular, ordinary people who sit in the pews, whose only desire is to understand the Bible better. Since 2014, we've catered for a wide range of persons as young as 10 years old and the people into their 80s. So it's something that the average person can really understand and grasp. Although we cater primarily for people in the pews, we've had a few pastors who came and they felt that they should just sharpen up their, their information base on the Word of God. Since 2014, we've helped almost 400 persons ranging from young to way into the 80s. The program lasts for a year. Every Tuesday from 7 to 9, we meet. And for four Saturdays for the entire year, every quarter, we have what we call a quarterly assessment meeting. The quarterly is from 9 to 4. We also have online facilities, and we've been really blessed. We have had people from USA, Canada, Europe, the Caribbean countries, 
Tobago and we actually have what we call a local online group or groups of people who cannot come to what we call in class in Digo Martin. It doesn't matter where you are, you can access School of the Bible. We have lectures, we have group reports, individual book reports, movies, training in all our presentations that we call Five Minutes So Minute, uh, PowerPoint presentations, I mean you name it we have it and we cover a wide range of uh, topics. Our main resources are the Bible and the seven manuals and I'm going to just quickly um, give you a sense of the manual. Volume 1 contains the overview of the Bible and the first five books of the Bible called the books of Moses, the books of the law or the Pentateuch. It goes from Genesis to Deuteronomy. Volume 2 are what we call the books of history from Joshua to Esther. Volume 3 are the books of poetry from Job to Song of Solomon. Volume 4, books of prophecy and the books of prophecy are divided into the minor prophets, major prophets. The major prophets are from Isaiah to Daniel, minor prophets Hosea to Malachi. When you come to the school of the Bible, you will get a further understanding as to why they are called minor and major. Shifting into the New Testament, Volume 5 are the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John and the one historical book, the book of Acts. Volume number six are letters of Paul, they are called the Pauline epistles from Romans to Philemon. And volume number seven are the general letters written by a variety of authors from Hebrews to Jude and then the one book of prophecy in the New Testament, the book of Revelation. Other resource materials are available on request. We, we have them there. If you wish for them, they're not compulsory, you can request them and we'll order them for you. We want to give you a little example of what um, some of the volumes look like and so we have the cover page for the overview of the Bible, the cover page for the book of Genesis and the cover page for the comparative study of the Gospel. Call us at 633-3780 for further information and this information will be for 2020. A brochure will be sent to you with all the information you will need. See you in School of the Bible in 2020. This week, our book of the week is The Mysterious Kingdom of Heaven by Donnell Duncan. Donnell is our first son, the eldest of three children. And it says how God's system differs from all others. It says, what are the mysteries of the kingdom? It's highly unlikely that any two persons on earth will have the same response. In the mysterious kingdom of heaven, author Donnell Duncan presents a compelling answer. By analyzing selected parables of the kingdom in the words of Jesus Christ, he simplifies the most important message of the end times. In addition, he removes the veil covering the mysteries of prophecy, the Trinity, and the Holy Spirit. The mysterious kingdom of heaven is a quick, easy read with direct scriptural support. If you have any systems of beliefs, whether you like it or not, you have a religion. Therefore, if you claim to believe in the teachings of Jesus Christ, by definition, you have a religion that is commonly known as Christianity. For the sake of argument in this book, The Mysterious Kingdom of Heaven, let us define Christianity as following Christ, the same way we define Buddhism as following Buddha. You need to get this book. Uh, and. Uh, in this verse, Jesus says, I have given them your word, talking to God in prayer, in John 17, 14 to 19. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world as I am not of the world. Now, there's more to read, but I want to finish here. And Donnell writes, the world is not a place then. A place doesn't have feelings and cannot hate someone. Because Jesus says the world will hate you. So what Jesus is talking about is not just a place. The same person can be in the world one day and be out of the world the next. That's the testimony of every Christian. The world actually refers to the cultural systems which come out of secular beliefs. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world is the devil. So even the people who claim to have no God are given one by default. This is interesting reading. <laughs> the Mysterious Kingdom of Heaven by Donald Duncan. You need to put your hand on this book. The numbers are going to be scrolled across the screen. You can call to find out how you can get this book in your hand. I don't want you to ever forget what Jesus said. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. God bless you real good.